Well, good evening, brothers and sisters. Good evening, brother. Good evening. <laughs> All right, I've got a question for you. I want you to raise your hands if this, what is sometimes called the Green Hymn Book, is the only Christadelphian hymn book you can remember. In other words, you don't remember the days when we used to sing from this hymn book. So raise your hands. This is the only hymn book. So there's a number of hands that are going up. It's actually appropriate that we're, you can put your hands down now. Yeah, it's actually appropriate we should be looking at the hymn book this particular year because this is actually the 20th anniversary of this hymn book, believe it or not. It doesn't seem that long ago that we were transitioning from this hymn book to this one. At least for me, it doesn't seem long ago, but uh, it's been 20 years since we did that. So we want to talk this evening a little bit about, um, about the, uh, the hymn book. One other thing I was going to do, and just was like, I'm just going to go over to the hymn board here, because those that raise their hands, just to drive this point home, may have no idea why you would ever have the letter A show up on a hymn board. In fact, I gave this, um, this class uh, for originally as a CYC class, and I, put, I brought the hymn board into the room, and I put the letter A up there with a number after it, and I said, does anyone know what this A is about? And there was only one person that put up their hand in that room. They had no clue. And so that the A stood for anthems, which we used to have in all the previous versions of the hymn books. So that's why those A's are there. They're not in use today, but they're, uh, I see they're in this hymn box here, obviously preserved from 20 years ago. Now I have another question, another one to uh, put your hands up for. I want you to put your hands up if you can recall a time before the 1964 hymn book. Can you remember singing from a hymn? Yeah, there, I thought there might be a number that can recall singing from a previous version. So actually, you can put your hands down. So, so some of you may have actually gone through three, maybe at least three different hymn books over your years. So we have a wide range within this room of some that have only known one, some that may have known three or more hymn books, depending on the ecclesia you come from and, and what's transpired there in, in different parts of the world. Hymn singing is a very important part of our worship together. Have you ever thought about how many hymns you sing in the course of a year? Now, you might have to do some simple little math about this. I mean, every ecclesia is going to be a little different. In our ecclesia, we sing 10 hymns a week. And you work that out and you start doing the math and give and take that some weeks we don't sing 10 and other weeks we sing more than that. Anyway, it works out to something like 500 hymns at least a year that we sing. And your ecclesia may be the same. It may be a little bit uh, different, maybe a little less. Who knows, maybe a little more. Um, but hymn singing is something we do a lot. In fact, quite often, wherever we go with our Bibles, the hymn book comes with us. And yet we don't often spend the time to actually talk about the hymn book. How many have actually heard a talk, say, in the last 10 years, specifically about the hymn book? Put your hands up. So a few. Now, put your hands down if, the, if it's my talk, this talk that you've heard. <laughs> Because some, some of you have, right? It's not, it's not something that's very common. Not something we do. I think there, was, there were some talks that were probably given, I think, here at Shippensburg, I'm told, when the, around the time when the new hymn book came out. But it's not something we really spend that much time doing, and yet we use our hymn book all the time. So sometimes it's good to actually stand back like we're doing this evening and actually look at the hymn book and see what was it that was involved uh, in putting this together. And what, did the, what, what scriptural principles did the brethren uh, have in order to develop the hymn book and to guide them in what was going to go in and what was going to be kept out of the hymn book? 
So our agenda tonight, we have a pretty full agenda that we will we'll get through. Um, we're going to talk about the, the first century heritage of hymn singing, which is why do we sing hymns today? The apostolic instruction regarding hymns, which takes us to that reading in Colossians. The guiding principles that come out of that for the formation of the hymn book. The history of past books and the story of our current. Now that looks like a lot because I originally gave this as a two-part series. And some have been asking me and saying, well, how are you going to get two classes into one? So I thought what we would do is we would just combine the two into one back to back and leave five minutes for Brother Dennis um, to do his, 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 his much-loved uh, uh, tabernacle study. No, we will, we will get done in, in the allotted time and go through. So we will be moving fairly fast. And uh, for those who have heard this before, in the fuller version, there will be stuff cut out because we obviously can't uh, get through it. So we might ask ourselves, why do we sing hymns? You know, not everybody in the ecclesia likes singing hymns. Some people just get up and, well, they've got to stand up because that's what we do. And they just stand there and they don't do anything because they just don't, they don't like singing hymns. Maybe we don't want to hear them sing the hymns, but, uh, but why is it that we do sing hymns? Is it just because it was passed down from church tradition that when Christadelphians were formed, well, that's what they, people did in their previous churches and now they brought it in? No, that's not the reason. The reason's because it's an apostolic principle. It's a first century practice that the believers got together and they sang hymns together. In fact, music stretches its way all the way back, right to the beginning of creation. We have that reference in Job to the angels singing at creation. We don't know what they sang, but they sang, it says in Job, that the morning stars sang together. And you can go all through the Old Testament, and there's, there's whole songs, chapters, such as uh, in Exodus, the Song of Moses. We've got the Song of Deborah and Barak. You get to the time of David, where David instituted music as a part of the temple worship where he actually had singers that were assembled there when people came to bring the offerings. And, and sometimes we don't often think about that, that when people made their offerings at the, at the temple, there were singers that were actually singing at that time. Why? Well, it was to elevate their minds to the to spiritual principles and the things uh, that they were doing to get their minds in the right focus. And when we come into the New Testament... Well, we find in New Testament times that they were singing as well. And so I've put some references on the screen. We're not going to look at all of them, but I, I suppose the first one is the, is the one we're probably most familiar with because sometimes it's quoted when we have our memorial service that the Lord Jesus Christ sang a hymn with his disciples in the upper room after the partaking of the emblems. And that's why we have hymn singing as part of our memorial service when we come together, because that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. He sang with his disciples. And then we've got other examples of singing. But if we want to know, well, did the first century ecclesia actually sing together? Well, Paul speaks on at least two occasions in Ephesians and Colossians about the psalms, the hymns, and the spiritual songs that would be sung within the Ecclesia and what those should be consisting of. And those provide us with a good, uh, first of all, they tell us that yes, the first century Ecclesia was involved in hymn singing, but they also, as I said, give us the guiding principles of what our psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs should consist of. So back to that reading in Colossians, we're just going to take a look at that one passage ever so briefly. Now, you'll notice the next couple of slides, there's going to be a lot of references and things. They're there if you want to note them down. I'm not going to be going through them. We're just going to comment, make a couple of comments. First of all, whether you're looking at Colossians 3 or whether you're looking to the parallel reference in the letter to the Ephesians, the context is exactly the same. The context is about, in Colossians, putting on the new man, putting off the old man, setting your minds on the things above. And in Colossians, it's very, I mean, in Ephesians, it's very similar. Walk as children of light is the idea. 
And in that context is where we find these verses about singing hymns. So the first thing we learn about singing hymns is they are to assist us in putting on the new man. They're to assist us in elevating our minds to think upon the things above. And what we find here is when we go to verse 16 of Colossians chapter 3, it says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know, I think the whole verse applies to singing of hymns and the music. That it begins in verse 16 where it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Our hymns and spiritual songs have the ability to help us get God's word into our mind. Have you ever got a song stuck in your head? I'm sure we've all had that from time to time. Actually, earlier this week, I was asking the, the young people, I was asking them, um, do you ever, do you find it easier to learn scripture and to memorize scripture when it's part of a song? And they all shook their heads. Yes, it's much easier to learn scripture and remember it when it's part of a song. And that's one of the wonderful things about music that it allows us to help, it helps us to remember things, but it also helps us to take these words and to elevate them. And to make them, as it were, soar with beauty and lift them to a whole other level. But they have to be based in the word. You see, this is the, this is the first uh, principle, we might say, that comes out of this verse. That the music that we have is going to allow us to get the word in. That it might dwell richly within us. And that word richly means copiously or abundantly, and that's what we want. And we, we, it, was, it was in the talk this morning, wasn't it? That we need to be filling ourselves up with the God's word, right? And, and, and hymn singing is one of those ways that we can do that. We can get the word into our minds richly, abundantly, copiously. That the word might dwell in us. The next part of this verse says that we're going to be teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So there's a way in which the hymns that we sing, the spiritual songs which are sung, can teach and admonish. That is to give instruction, to give warning, to be reproving and exhorting one another. And sometimes the hymns do just that for us. We can be taught by them. We can be exhorted by them. And then it says, that we, at the end of the verse, that we're singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And this is about how we sing, the spirit in which we sing. Thayer says, prompted by the grace of it, we sing. We sing prompted by the grace of God. So in response to the grace that God has shown us, we pour out our hearts in the singing of hymns. And that's the spirit in which we sing these hymns. But of all the components of music, what would be the most important, most critical component of our hymns? Is it the tune? Is it the beat or the rhythm? Is it the instruments that accompany it? No, it's none of those things. It's the words. The words are the most important thing. And great attention needs to be paid to the words to make sure that they are correctly bringing our attention to the things of the scriptures and reflecting them accurately. And so in summary... Now, we didn't look at the Ephesians reference, but I put it on the screen there if you, you wish to glance down that. But it's very similar to the Colossians reference. So just summarizing what we saw in the Colossians reference, spiritual music allows the word to dwell in us richly. It imparts spiritual wisdom. It teaches and admonishes at times. It's an expression of the heart. It's a response to the grace of God shown towards us. 
and it helps us to put on that new man. Do we think of the hymns like that? You know, as I say, you might not be uh, love to sing, but if you can find within the hymns as we sing them, or as you stand up and, and if you're not going to sing, then if you're going to listen to them, trying to find, trying to let those words sink in and let them be instructive to us. So these verses in Ephesians and Colossians were what really formed the guiding principles to our hymn book. And in fact, that's why right on the very front of our hymn book, we actually have psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms, which takes us directly to those two passages in Ephesians and Colossians, because that's where that's lifted out from. So what were the guiding principles to the formation of the book? Well, it goes without saying after what we just looked at, the words and the subject matter of the hymns chosen were the most important thing, and they had to be reflective not only of correct belief, but what the brethren wanted when they put together the hymn book was they wanted a book that reflected the breadth of scriptural teaching and present our unique beliefs as a community in a straightforward, non-compromising way. Now what we mean by this as being the breadth of scriptural teaching, they didn't want a book that was all just about the kingdom. They didn't want a book that was all just about Jesus. They wanted a book that reflected all of our teaching in all its various aspects, in the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ and the things concerning the kingdom of God. And so that's why we find hymns on all kinds of subjects. And and it's an interesting thing to actually go through the hymn book and to actually take what it is that we believe, and to actually find the hymns that actually support those teachings. In fact, I'd suggest to you, you could probably teach the truth to somebody by just giving them the hymn book. No, I don't suggest that's the means by which we should teach someone the truth, but you could, because all our first principles are in there. I just have a few examples, and we're not going to go through all of them. But for instance, you want to teach someone or we want to remind ourselves that God rules in the kingdoms of men and sets up over them the basis of men. Well, we have hymn 91, high over lashing waves, our God is throned, which brings that principle out ever so clearly. If we want to be reminded, just going down the list, um, hymn 335, which we sang earlier this week, one of my favorites. If we want to be reminded of Christ, that Christ declared God's righteousness in his sacrifice and was victorious over sin and death, we have 335, we praise the Heavenly Father. We have our baptismal hymn. I know in our ecclesia we sing almost every time we have a baptism. The water and the blood, O Lord, hymn 333. It comprises these, all these ideas. Baptism comes in response to understanding God's word. It washes us of our sins. It identifies us with Christ's death and resurrection. Puts us in the way of salvation. All those ideas are summed up in that hymn. And we could go on. But it just gives you an idea that our hymns are rich in our understanding of the scriptures and the beliefs that we have as a community. And that was one of the things that was intended when they put the book together. And so then, when we think about the tunes, and sometimes the hymn book, yes, has been criticized for having fairly bland or boring tunes, depending on on who you are and and, and what you, you want to be singing. But the idea here was that the tunes were chosen for the hymns to place the words at the forefront and the tunes secondary. In other words, the tunes are there to elevate the words without taking over the words as being the predominant thing. That was important. You see, and that's something that sets us apart, I think, from from hymns in other churches, where it's not about the beat, it's not about the rhythm, it's not about being entertained. 
It's about us having these scriptural words and then elevating them, but the focus still being on the words. And so lyrics that were overly simple, such as children's songs, right, were rejected. They didn't want a book that was a children's book. We have other books in the community for that. But uh, the hymn book was never designed to be a, a children's book. So lyrics that were overly simple, if, the, if a hymn had that, they were rejected. Where lyrics were overly repetitious, that was rejected. If they were overly self-centered, so there's a lot of hymns that are out there where the focus is all on me. Now, yes, we have some hymns where the focus is on ourselves and, and trials that we endure, but the primary focus of our hymns should not be about us. It should be on God and bring glory to him. And so if they were overly self-centered, then, then they didn't include those in the hymn book. If the words were ambiguous, you know, we didn't quite know what it was talking about, then they wanted to get rid of that. Now, sometimes hymns have ended up in the book where, yes, it's been a little bit, you kind of scratch your head and wonder, what, what is this talking about? You know, Brother Jason last night talked about words that change meanings or words that go out of style. And, and yeah, the, in, a, in the 1964 book, there were some hymns with examples of words that we'll have one later. We'll show you where the... Uh, we, you don't quite know what it's talking about. And so they changed the words to make it clearer. But if, if the hymn, if you read the whole hymn and you, don't, you just have no clue what it's talking about, then they didn't want that. There would need to be clarity. If they were overly Jesus-focused, and again, this gets back to the more evangelical side of things, where hymns, a lot of spiritual songs that are there, place a lot of emphasis on Jesus without getting the right balance without the proper understanding that God was in his son reconciling the world to himself. And so if they were overly Jesus-focused, where we almost, instead of looking at, uh, honoring Jesus as the highly exalted son of God, we sort of bring, pull him down to be buddy-buddy, well, those hymns were excluded as well because we wanted to get the right focus that the Lord Jesus has been highly exalted to the Father's right hand, the head of the ecclesia. And of course, if a hymn didn't include, express biblical truth, it was rejected as well. Now sometimes, a hymn may be perfectly fine with the exception of one or two verses, or just a few words here and there that need to be changed. So I have a couple of examples, uh, one of them is a funny example, of some hymns where we've actually dropped um, a verse. Now the first example I'm going to show I'm not going to put it on the screen just yet. I just need to preface this. Even some of the other churches have changed the lyrics first. So before it even got to us, it was changed. But you go back to the very original version of the hymn, He Who Would Valiant Be. Are you familiar with that hymn? He Who Would Valiant Be Against All Disaster. You go back to the very original version of that hymn, and this is what you would be singing Hobgoblin, nor foul fiend can daunt his spirit. He knows he at the end shall life inherit. Now imagine if we had that in our hymn book. We all got up on Sunday morning and started singing about hobgoblins. <laughs> well, obviously, uh, as I say, even other churches had a problem with that, and, uh, and, and that verse was even changed before it got to our hymn book. But Abide With Me, which we sang last night, has a fifth verse, which we don't have in our hymn book because the allusions here and, and the references seem very clearly to be towards uh, de death and going to heaven when you die. It says, hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes, shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O Lord, abide with me. So with that kind of idea, it was obviously, they took that out. Now, of course, copyright has to be honored, so they have to get permission for a lot of hymns, if they're still under copyright, to be able to make these changes. Sometimes, where changes weren't able to be made because of the copyright, then they weren't able to end up in our hymn book because um, they wanted to make sure that the hymns were scripturally accurate first and foremost, while also making sure that we fulfilled our obligations, uh, legal obligations, 
of not having something printed that uh, we didn't have the legal right to do. So that gets us into the history of the book. Now what time is it? There we are, 7.45. Okay, we're good. So we're going to go all the way back now into the 1800s to the time of Brother Roberts. Now it's been pointed out to me that there were some other hymn books in the community before this one, but um, I think probably it's, it might be safe to say, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, that the Golden Harp was one of the earliest, more widespread or wide, widely used hymn books um, in the community, and that came, uh, Brother Roberts put that together in 1864. And then you can see on the screen here, I tried to put a timeline together of some of the other hymn books that have come. And these are the hymn books from the central community, I will say. Um, we'll come to an example of one from another fellowship, which um, came in and, and um, which comes into the story of one of the other, the other hymn books. But um, actually, you can see there that the um, 1874 hymn book, it got, the rights of it got passed on to the Don Fellowship in 1953, so they ended up with, with that hymn book. But uh, that said, um, we just look at the Golden Harp. Now, most of this information, by the way, is all from the Christadelphia magazine, but if, um, and you can go back through over the years and, and glean all this information from it, but if you want to actually have a copy of the Golden Harp or uh, some of the other older hymn books, you can find them on the Christadelphian vault, but they're hidden deep in there. So I'm giving you the path to be able to find them. You've got to go into Bible Docs and then to another folder called Hymns, and then you will find these four files here, the Golden Harp being one of them. So the Golden Harp was put together in 1864. Just words, no music. And I want you just to ponder that idea for a moment what the implications of that were. Imagine we had a hymn book with just words, no music. Yeah, you're going to sing a tune, but uh, it doesn't mean you're just going to stand up and just read the words. You are going to sing, but just think about the implications of what that means. Think about if that was the case for us here, coming to this Bible school, what it would mean. And we'll come to it in a moment, okay? Now, as you know, um, books back in the 1800s had very long titles. You know, the whole summary of the book is on the front cover. Uh, when you go back to the pioneer writings. And that was true for this hymn book. And I've reproduced it because I don't think you're going to read that dark image there. It says, The Golden Harp, or Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs Compiled for the Use of Immersed Believers in the Things Concerning the Kingdom of God and the Name of Jesus Christ. So notice a few things. First of all, what's the purpose of the hymn book? It's for the use of immersed believers, those who have been baptized into the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. It's for those who knew the truth. That's who were to be singing these hymns. That's who it was designed for. And also notice that it says right on the cover, Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, just like our hymn book does today. So another thing that's interesting about this being on the front cover is that it actually takes us right back to the golden harp and what was on the very first hymn book. There were 155 hymns and 89 of them remain in our hymn book to this day. Now, I keep saying I'm going to do this exercise, and I never seem to get around to it, but uh, I think it would be very interesting to actually go through and mark in your hymn book these hymns. So when you, when you get to a hymn like, Hail to the Brightness of Zion's Glad Morning, you could put like a little GH on it, so that when you come to that, you can go, oh, that was in the Golden Harp. Brother Robert sang that hymn. Brethren, back in 1864, we're singing this hymn, just like we do today. Hark, tis the watchman's cry. Most glorious things are spoken. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. These were all in that original hymn book Brother Roberts put together, and we still sing them today. The words might have changed here and there a little bit, but, uh, but generally speaking, they're the same hymns. Now, in the preface to the Golden Harp, Brother Roberts talks about the selection of hymns. Like, how did they select these hymns to go in there? And so this is, I'm going to translate this as we go through because it's very old English language. 
He says, the hymnal effusions of the age, which means the hymns of our day, though copious and talented, there's many of them, some of them are very, talentedly, very, very talentedly written, they are with few exceptions so hopelessly defiled with the rampant religious heresies of the time as to be quite unfit for the use of those who have rejected apostate traditions and gone back to the forgotten doctrines of ancient times. So he says we can't use them as a community. He says the following collection has therefore been compiled that this class of individuals like ourselves, he's talking about, that we may indulge in the luxury of collective praise and meditation without having their intelligence outraged and their religious emotions checked and violated by the foolish words put into their mouths by ordinary hymnal compositions. Now, I love that language because I don't know if we would quite express it the same way. Like, if, if you have a hymn that you're going to sing and it's got wrong doctrine in there, would you, would you say that your intelligence is outraged? Uh, but that's how, that's how they felt. And uh, uh, I suppose that's how we should feel as well. So that's how, how, how Brother Roberts put it. Well, that golden harp only lasted about five years because in 1869 came along the first hymn book that had the name Christadelphian on the title. It was compiled by Brother Robert Roberts and Brother J.J. Andrew. And yes, this is the J.J. Andrew that we would know about for bringing some false doctrine into the community. So, but this was before that time. So there were 273 hymns um, in that hymn book. But again, words only, no music. So we still have this problem going on in this hymn book. But it's expanded, right? We've gone from 100 and something hymns now to 273. As we say, this is the, the, the first hymn book with, oh, oh, sorry, 1874. We're coming up to 1874 now. So we've gone ahead from uh, about six, uh, six seven years um, to 1874. And now we get the first hymn book with music. So what would be a problem with a hymn book with no music? Well, let's read what Brother C.C. Walker had to say. The advantages of harmonious song will be more generally diffused throughout the body the skill of all will doubtless be increased, and a community of worship will arise in all the ecclesias from the possession of a common form of praise. Heretofore, or up to this point, a brother from one ecclesia visiting another has found totally different tunes in use from those to which he has been accustomed. By the new hymn book, it will doubtless become a rule that the same tunes will be sung to the same hymns everywhere. Thus, traveling brethren will be saved from the spiritual discomfort of having to sing familiar and edifying words to unaccustomed strains. So imagine, brothers and sisters, that all of our ecclesias all had different tunes for the hymns that we're going to sing. And we all come here to sing hymn 95, and we're all singing it to a different tune. Um, or we just don't know the tune. Um, and so that was the problem. And so now in 1874, now there was unity brought to the body on this basis that we were all singing the same tunes to the same hymns. So that was very helpful. Now, when they put the music in to the hymn book, there were actually two different forms of music in the book. So here's a picture of the hymn, After Thy Loving Kindness, Lord which I'm sure most of us are familiar with. You'll notice at the top, there's the music that we're familiar with today that we have in the hymn book. So the question is, whoops, where's the pointer? Oh, there we are. What's all that down at the bottom? Well, that's another form of musical notation that doesn't exist uh, today, at least not that I've seen. Went out of style, I believe, uh, but it was around in the 1800s. So I'm going to tell you how this works. It's very simple. You can see that there's a bunch of, uh, if you can read that, I know, it's, I know it's small, but if you can read that, we've got a bunch of like D, D, R, M, R, D, F, R, and you go, what is that? Well, this is called the sol fa musical notation. Now, I'm sure most of you, when you went to school, you learned 
Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Did you learn that? So that's exactly what this is. So I'm going to give you the, uh, I'm going to give you a, 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 I'm going to sing this for you. It goes, do, do, re, mi, re, do, fa, re, re, mi, so, so, fa, so. That's how they knew what to sing, because they couldn't read this music that we're familiar with, but if they knew their do, re, mi's, then they would be able to figure out what note they should be singing on. So that's what that musical notation was about. It's the only hymn book, by the way, that had that musical notation in it. And uh, we're not going to read this quote um, for the sake of time, but this is uh, basically saying that, again, it went through a very um, strict um, revision to make sure that hymns were uh, appropriate and that they were doctrinally sound. And as he says there at the end, as a whole, the hymn department has been improved. So, Another interesting thing in the preface of the 1874 hymn book, maybe something we haven't actually thought about before, is should hymns be sung at lectures? Well, every ecclesia is going to have a different answer to that as to whether they sing hymns at public lectures or not. Um, and what this advised was that, um, yes, hymns can be sung at public lectures, but hymns should not be willing, the hymn book should not be willingly given to the stranger, as no man can come unto the Father unless he has Christ. But if he gets hold of one and sings along, no harm is done. So, um, as a further extension to that, though, um, we might say we, we do need to be careful with the selection of hymns um, for public lectures when we have friends that we're specifically inviting to come along. Now, they might not know the hymn and they might not be able to sing, but we might need to just think about that for a moment. There are a lot of hymns which actually the words can only be sung properly by those who are actually believers of the truth. There are other hymns which are actually more generic in nature and probably more fitted for a public audience where we're actually just reflecting on biblical principles, but not actually, they wouldn't be, you know, someone that's not baptized, someone that's not in the truth would be able to then sing. So it's just something to think about and ponder. Every ecclesia will make their own decision on that. Well, that brings us to the 1932 hymn book, which probably some of you are, uh, might have been familiar with. Um, and this was uh, an initiative led by Brother C.C. C. Walker over a number of years. He wrote in the Christadelphia Magazine, 1931, a long proposed revision of the hymn book, blocked by the war, that's the First World War, and subsequent untoward conditions, is now well in progress. It involves the revision of music and words of the existing book and the addition of a number of new hymns, Concerning this last item, a very conservative attitude will be taken to avoid the introduction of anything doctrinally unsound to which legitimate objections might be taken. And while Brother C.C. Walker had the best of intentions, it didn't quite work out that way. Because we put at the bottom of the screen, there was some controversy over some selections that ended up in the hymn book. So much so that right after it had been published, a committee of six brethren had to be put together to look into these comments that were coming back. And they reported back in 1933, which led to a further revision of that book. So, one example of a hymn that was in the very first print of the 1932 book was Hark the Herald Angels Sing, which you might be familiar with because it's a very popular uh, tune, with these words, speaking of Christ, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Now, would you be comfortable singing those words? See, Brother C.C. Walker believed that if you could read them and sing them with the interpretation of God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, then you could sing them and it would be fine. But it didn't sit well with many. And uh, I know it makes me a little uncomfortable to, 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 to sing those words 
And, uh, and so that was one of the, one of the ones um, where they actually had to remove that and replace it with another hymn when the, the next edition came out of the 1932 book. But I do know it's a fact that it was in there um, because not only is it written about in the Christadelphia magazine, but I went to the Christadelphian office back in uh, 2014 and uh, Brother Andrew Graham Hill pulled out uh, that original 1932 book and he showed me and he, and he showed me that hymn there in it. So I do know that this is truth. It did exist, uh, but only for one edition and not for very long. So that leads us to the 1964 book. This is the book that I grew up with. And this is the book that I knew all the hymn numbers to. Unfortunately, I think when you grow up learning hymn numbers and with this book, I, I've never been able to master the, the hymn numbers and learn them the way I did with the 64 book. But this was a, an initiative led by um, eight brethren, headed up by Brother John Carter and Brother L.G. Sargent. Now, Brother Carter fell asleep in Christ two years before the book went to print. But it was a work that began in 1958 and was necessitated by the reunion that took place between the Suffolk Street and the Central Community. And you see, Suffolk Street had their own hymn book. And we had our own, <laughs> the Central Community had the hymn book, the 1932 book. And so now you had a reunion take place, but we had two different hymn books. So was everyone expected to now carry around two different hymn books with them and, and figure out which one they were going to sing from? You see, the Suffolk Street book had come, come about in 1903, and it had taken, well, the, I guess the previous book, and it added 90 new hymns to it, 16 new anthems, removed nine hymns and 12 anthems, and so there was quite a bit of difference between these two books. And so the idea behind the 64 book was, let's get one book for our united community. So that was the background behind it. Now there were nine additional hymns added in 1983. Now you might remember this. Um, where I remember, I recall, that in some books there was a supplemental section where there was these nine hymns, including O Morning for Zion. And then, but if you had an older hymn book, it didn't have them in. So I can always recall that because the brother, the presiding brother said, we're gonna sing now O Morning for Zion and some of us had it in our hymn book and some of us didn't. And it was very kind of awkward. So um, that, that, that provided some difficulty. But they did add those nine. There were nine that were added. And all of which, I believe most of which, came over into, into the hymn book we have now. But there was a major policy change with the 64 book that created some more controversy. You see, they decided that the acknowledgments, that is, who wrote the hymn originally, was going to be put onto the page with the hymn right at the bottom. Now, maybe you might not think, well, that, that's not a big deal, so what? It's, you know, we can just look at the bottom and see who wrote it. But for some brethren, especially the Australian ecclesias, that was a big deal. It was one of the reasons why they never adopted the 1964 book. I say one of the reasons, there were other reasons, but it was one of them. Because some felt that by putting the name of non-Christadelphians on the bottom, why would you draw attention? We're, our minds are supposed to be focused on the things of, of God and the things of his truth, and now all of a sudden you've got, we've got people listed and their names. And maybe you might even know who that person is and what they actually believed, and they're not Christadelphians, and maybe then you start reading things into these hymns according to what they believed. So... That provided a challenge, and that, as I say, one of the reasons why um, the hymn book, the 64 book, was never accepted in Australia. In fact, some ecclesias in Australia only just in the last few years switched over to this hymn book. Um, Sister Rita and I went to, to a Bible school um, a few years ago in Australia, and we actually had to obtain a new print of the 1932 book, because that's what they sang there. So we have this nice new print of uh, 1932, very nice hymn book. Um, but uh, I've heard that since then they've, they've moved over to the uh, 2002 hymn book. So 
but it, it's been a, a long journey. And, and again, that was one of the, one another reason why it was suggested we, we have a new hymn book that we have today as our green hymn book was because they, again, they wanted to try and bring unity to the brotherhood, one hymn book. I'm just gonna skip over uh, one here. Okay, so that brings us to uh, the story of our hymn book and what do I have left? I've got about four minutes left. Okay, so we're gonna pick up the pace here. It all began in 1994. There was a letter to the editor suggesting a review of the hymn book in the Christadelphia magazine. That's how it all got started. Someone wrote a letter. And in 1995, the Christadelphia Magazine Publishing Association took up the idea. They sent a letter to the entire English-speaking world and to gauge the willingness to be able to put together a revision of the hymn book. In that letter, the parameters were outlined as to how they were going to, what were going to be the guiding principles to putting the book together. It's very similar to what we saw went through earlier. And on October of that year, two thirds of the Ecclesias had responded, and the desire to have a new hymn book was actually strongest outside of the.